of the living God, dear friends and church. And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chiefs, and the, and the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together, and Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, and their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent. And made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Son of Man? Are you the Son? Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. Let's pray. Our gracious God, there's a sense where seeing our Lord Jesus Christ being treated as a criminal, being treated as a, as a man of no repute, as a man of no worth, being spat upon, being stricken with blows, sinful hands striking the sinless one. Help us, Lord. Help us to feel the weight of the text. Help us to be encouraged by your word. And we ask that your spirit would apply it to our hearts in a mighty and powerful way. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Well, there's, you know, with all the Senate hearings going on and the Supreme Court justices being appointed, um, you know, Amy Coney Barrett was just appointed as a Supreme Court justice. For some reason, I've been to frenzy in watching all the recent ones happen. You know, I've seen hours and hours of Gorsuch and Kavanaugh and Clarence Thomas and even Scalia. And there's just something fascinating about seeing people who think that they're wise, think that they're, that, that they're the ones who are the arbitrators of the law, interview a Supreme Court justice, someone who has their Ph.D. in law, you have these congressmen and these senators who have no wisdom of themselves, who barely have a grasp on what law is, and they think that they can interview experts of the law. It's so silly that our system is set up this way, right? You have these average people who have never went to school for law, and yet they're the ones interviewing the Supreme Court justices to be appointed. But really, what we have here is Jesus, the true judge of all the earth, being judged by sinful men. You have Jesus, the wisest of all councils being here, judged, condemned, saying he's deserving of death. We see here truly the apex, apex of all of history is coming to a close, dear church. We've had the last week, the Passover week. We've had all the, 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 the Garden of Gethsemane. We had the arrest. And now we're here in the courtroom, as it were. The trials and the cross is ever before the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows once this trial ends, I'll be carried away to that cross. But what were the trials of Jesus like? That'd be helpful for us in 2020 who aren't part of this world in the first century. What were the trials like? Well, Mark kind of puts them all together, but really there were six phases to a Jewish trial. The first phase was before, it was, it was when the, the council would come together and make a decision on how to proceed. That happens behind the scenes. The second phase of the Jewish trial was when you would take the accused before the high priest and the council and that's what we're reading about and then the third phase was the decision which is the end of our text and then from the jewish courts you get ushered to the roman courts where you go before pilate we see that in mark 15 which we'll read in a couple weeks then you get before herod the jurisdiction of the of the area that jesus is in then you go before pilate again that roman leader for the final decision six phases and this should be done drawn out you see, what's going on here is they're rushing this. 
They're trying to get it done as fast as possible. They're breaking their own rules. You weren't allowed to have a trial by night. You weren't, to, you weren't allowed to go back and forth between the Jewish and the Roman courts in one day. All this should have had deliberation. There should have been this, the, uh, decisions made over a period of about two weeks. But these men, they're hurried, they're rushed, they're moving quickly. Why? Because they have one goal, to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. No, to murder the Lord Jesus Christ. To put the Son of Life on that cross and kill Him. So we see here in verse 33, and they, laid the, and they led Jesus to the high priest. And all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. You see what's going on? They're coming together for one common goal. Can you just, in your mind, picture Christ, his hands bound, right? Probably a couple guards grabbing each arm, one behind him, one in front. They're treating him as a criminal. You have all three sects of the Sanhedrin, the council, with one goal. They're coming together to put him to death. And so it goes on in verse 54. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. You see, Peter... Remember, he's part of the group that fled. But there's something in Peter, his love for Christ. It's a real love. I don't want to diminish that. He wants to see. He wants to be in and around Christ. He's too fearful of man to go all the way with Christ. He's too fearful of being acquainted with Christ. Does that sound like some of us this morning? We want to be with Christ, but when it comes with our friends, uh, I'll just say that for Sundays. You know, Peter here is following because he wants to see what's going to happen to the man that I love. I ask you this morning, do you follow Christ at a distance just to see what's going on in Christianity? Just to see what's going on with your friends in Christianity? Wanting to go all in with him. But the fear of man makes you to light fires with men who hate your Lord. Peter is fearing truly man more than he's fearing God. But that sermon is for next week. So let's go on with verse 55 through 57. And now the chief priest and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him saying, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. So again, it's a typical scene. There's the accused. They're all trying to throw whatever sticks to the wall, right? They're throwing their accusations. They're throwing their false witnesses. And whatever sticks, they'll run with that. They can't even find anything to agree. They can't find any testimony that would line up with someone else's. You know, the saying goes, it's harder to remember a lie than the truth. They have nothing to pin on the Lord Jesus Christ. They have nothing. What are they going to say? Well, we saw him heal a man on the Sabbath. We saw him make a blind man see on the Sabbath. Truly, all that they, they could speak of the Lord Jesus Christ was good things. They have nothing against the fairest Lord Jesus. And here what we see is actually what should have been happening is there should have been two testimonies agreeing. That's the law of Moses, right? It's actually how we get Western law as well, natural law. You must have two or more witnesses that agree in order to come and charge someone with a crime. They don't have any witnesses that agree. This is truly the coup of all coups. The truly, the most, the, 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 the worst setup you'll ever see in all of history. Trying to find anything, dear friends, to pin on the Lord Jesus Christ. But they can't. They have nothing. They have nothing. Do you realize this? If any of us went to courts, surely they would find something that we've done wrong. Maybe someone saw us run a red light. Maybe someone saw, someone saw us do a California roll at a stop sign. Maybe someone saw us not return the extra change that we got, whatever. They would have plenty on us. But on the Lord Jesus Christ, they have nothing. Truly a sinless man. They have no agreeable witness. And we see this again when they say, oh, he said that he would destroy the temple. He'd also say he'd build it back up. What, what is there to charge against him? And we all know that in John 2, he's talking not about the physical temple. He's talking about his own body that he'll destroy and lift back up. You see, they have nothing. They twist his words. Man, if this was around in our day, it would be a mockery of what's going on. We think some of the impeachment trials were a mockery. No, this is truly a mockery. They have nothing on the Lord Jesus Christ, but they are determined to kill him at whatever cost. Even if they had to lie 
Remember, these are religious leaders. These aren't just common folk. These are the pastors of the day, bearing false witness in the temple of God. They're not bearing false witness on the streets. They're bearing false witness where they know the Holy of Holies is just in the other room. Before the face of God, they are literally going to any extreme to satisfy the sinful desires that they have in their heart. And we see this continue to come out more and more as the scene develops. Look at verses 60 through 62. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. And again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Now, if you can actually read the Greek and if you get all the gospel accounts, if you can envision this room, this is the, 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 the Jewish courtroom of the day. The accused is in the middle. And then you have a semicircle around the accused. You have the high priest, then you have the priest, and here you would have the, the, the elders, and then you'd have the chief priest and the council. So around the circle, you would have these three groups, and the accused is in the middle. And Caiaphas, the high priest, this wicked man, just says, you know, I've had enough. He gets up, he storms out of his seat, and he's not just passively walking away. No, he's in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's trying to intimidate him, dear church. And what he's trying to do is trying to, is trying to get Christ to say something that would pin him for guilty, to, to be guilty of death. He's saying, don't you have anything to say? Do you want to respond to these claims against you? And the Lord Jesus Christ, in all his wisdom, says nothing. Picture the scene. The high priest is yelling in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Say something. Please just say something. Your silence is driving me crazy. You know how it is. When someone's just silent, you want them to say at least something so you know that they're still engaged. He's saying, why don't you answer? But Christ, the man of integrity, doesn't stoop to their level, dear friends. He doesn't answer a fool according to their folly. No, he just stays silent. He knows, you have nothing on me. You have no accusation against me. If you had it, you would have said it by now, but there's nothing. This fulfills Isaiah 53 when it says, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, he remains silent before its shearers. Unlike us, right? Someone, hears, someone hurls an accusation at us, Man, we want to respond right away. We want to clear our name right away. We want to react in emotionalism. We want to react in, in, in our flesh. Let's learn a lesson here, church. Every time you might hear slander against your name, you don't need to address it. In fact, by addressing it, you might become a guilty party as well. Because half the time when we address sin that's accused of us, we just highlight someone else's sin. And it becomes this battle of who can outdo each other and who can highlight more sins about each other. But no, the Lord Jesus Christ is knowing, I am entrusting myself to the God of heaven, the judge of all the earth. I don't need to vindicate my name. The Lord already knows my name and he knows that it's clear. So if someone ever accuses you or slanders you with false information, you don't need to address it. You just let it go. And entrust yourself to the king of kings. And we see here Caiaphas is truly pressing the Lord Jesus Christ to give him anything. And he, in the other gospels it says, he makes Jesus take an oath that the next question he asks, Christ must answer it or else he's, or else he's breaking the oath of the courtroom. Matthew highlights that for us, Mark doesn't. So what we're about, to see, we're about to see next in verse 61b and verse 62, no, right before this, Caiaphas said, Christ, I'm bounding you to an oath that you must answer and I'm going to ask you. So Christ honors the system. Verse 61b, let's see what Caiaphas asks. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the most blessed? And Jesus said, I am and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Now don't tell me Christ didn't choose those words specifically. I am. He even here gets Psalm 110 and Daniel 7, two of the most powerful Messianic Old Testament verses ever in the Old Testament. The power of the Son of Man who will be given a kingdom by the Ancient of Days. 
And he says, you are sitting here thinking you are the judges. I'm that son of man who will come on the clouds to rule and to reign and to judge the living and the dead. It's as if he's saying, Caiaphas, elders, chief priests, council, you might see me as my hands are bound. You might see me in bondage by the bonds you put on me. You might see me confined to my chair. You might see me silent. But with this answer, it's as if Christ is saying, there is coming a day when you will see the kingdom given to me. There is coming a day where all you who are trying to judge me will one day be judged by, my, by me. Christ is here saying, I am the Son of Man, the blessed Son of Man who will be given a kingdom. O oh, Caiaphas on this day truly thought he was powerful in his puny little pride, standing up in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe even pointing a finger, a finger at him saying, answer them. Caiaphas has no idea who he's before. He has no idea who he's messing with this. With, and then you see him in his phony, fake acting. Man, you know how it is when people try to fake emotions. They try to seem like they're all desperate about what's going on. You might see politicians do this all the time on a certain side where they pretend to have grief and agony toward a certain group. Look at verse 63. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? Let me tell you something about Caiaphas real quick. This position was usually occupied for four years. Because remember, in this day, the Jewish temple was not squeaky clean. But he occupied this position for 19 years. He would be what we would call a career politician in our day. To remain the high priest for that long in this day, you had to have some skill. You had to be crafty. You had to be able to make decisions on the back end. Little side deals over, over here. Quid pro quo in the realest sense of the term. So Caiaphas, he knows what he's doing. He's playing on the emotions of the crowd. And he's saying, what, more, what, what further witnesses do we need? He's calling himself the son of God. Blasphemy. Blasphemy. Now Caiaphas, he's wise. He's wise because he's, I'm sure, being helped by an agent of darkness. But he's wise. And what does he do? Pressure tactics. Like he has the, the room is building up. The emotions are building up. Christ has admitted that he's the son. He's the Christ. He's the son of the most blessed. Caiaphas thinks we have him now. Let me tear my garments. Let me show everybody how impressed I am with his, his, his admitting to being the Christ. And look what he does to the other man in the room. Verse 63, 64, sorry. You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? What is your decision? In the Greek, he repeats it. What's your decision? What are you guys going to do? We don't need witnesses anymore. We don't need any more accounts. Decide right now. Decide what you're going to do with him. You, 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 you know this from pressure sale tactics. Use car men. Use car salesmen, right? They like to put pressure so you make decisions in haste. Wrongful decisions. Silly decisions. That's what Caiaphas is doing. You heard him say it. I tore my garments. He just called himself son of God. Blasphemy. Blasphemy. Make a decision. And truly some of the heaviest words you'll ever read toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And they all condemned him as deserving death. They all condemned him. Every single one of them. As deserving death. These men have no idea what they just pronounced. They can't even fathom what they just said about the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me show you something about the heart of man, dear church. There's times in the heart of man where we want A, whatever A is, right? We want A, which is a sin. We'll find any means necessary to get there. We'll even use the Bible to get there. We'll even use our friends to get there. You know how it is when you really want to attain something, to achieve something, to grab a hold of something. You'll rationalize any behavior to get there. That's what these judges are doing. That's what this council is doing. They want to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't care how they get there, but they'll do it. And they condemn him. Listen, they damn him. They find him guilty. Worthy of death. 
truly the tables are turned here. The Son of Life does not deserve death. The Son of God is not worthy of death. The Prince of Life is the one who gives life. It isn't pronounced upon him death. And verse 65, And some began to spit on him, and to cover his face, and to strike him, saying, Prophesy! And the guards received him with blows. In Isaiah, there's a verse that says that the Messiah could be blindfolded and by his mere smell could tell who was doing what. And in fact, throughout the ages of the Jewish customs, what they would do is when someone would come and say, I'm the Messiah, because it happened quite often, I'm the Messiah, what they would do is they would blindfold him and they would say, we'll strike you, you tell us who did it. And that was the test of Messiahship in this day. So here where they blindfold him, they're striking him with blows. They're, in a sense, they're saying, you're the Messiah? Show us you're the Messiah. Prophesy. Tell us who's hitting you. And I guarantee you, Christ, if, they would have, if he would have answered to them, would have been able to call out every single one of them. But he doesn't answer them. Because if he does, they won't arrest him. They won't take him to be killed. So he himself says, you know what? I won't answer the question. I know who's hitting me. I can smell who's hitting me. And they strike him. They spit on him. And every single culture on the face of the earth to spit on someone is the most grotesque, disrespectful thing you could do to someone and they spit on the Lord Jesus Christ. Just allow yourself, church, to sit in this courtroom at this moment. And we struggle because it's Christ and it's it's what He's supposed to do. I understand. But listen, imagine your loved one. Imagine someone you care about. Imagine it's someone, even your elderly parents, innocent, having done nothing and they're being spat upon. They're being blindfolded. They're being hit with blows. This should move our affections for the love that Christ has for His people, what He subjected Himself to for His church, for those that He was determined to save, being falsely accused, being slandered, being intimidated even by the high priest. And it's physical assault as well. Jesus, the judge of all the earth, is being judged by ungodly men. Truly a scene that's flipped on its head. So what do we grab from this, church? What do we take away from this and apply this to our lives? I'm not here just to give you a history lesson about the courtroom of Christ. That's fine. It's good that we know what took place that day. But how does this grip our hearts? How can we now apply this to our lives? How can this bear relevance to us in 2020? Well, number one, I just want to highlight once again depravity, human depravity is on display for us, church. Finding any single way to accomplish their sinful ends, it's disgusting. But secondly, I want to highlight what I think is truly important for us this morning. Caiaphas, the council, they all made a decision that day. They all, in effect, pronounced a judgment upon Christ. They pronounced what they thought Jesus was worthy of. They pronounced what they thought Jesus deserved. Church, every single day we do the same. What do I mean by that? Every single day in our actions, we declare what Christ is worthy of. We declare what Christ deserves. How do we do this? Well, when we are presented with a situation and it's either honoring the Lord or dishonoring the Lord. When we dishonor the Lord, we are pronouncing Christ, you're not worthy of my actions. You're not worthy of my heart. You're not worthy of my life. You're not worthy of my obedience. So before we scoff at Caiaphas and the council, know that every single day, dear church, when we choose self over Christianity, when we choose our sins over honoring God, we ourselves are saying, Christ, you're not worthy. You don't deserve my life. You don't deserve my obedience. Christ sat here silent, and his silence probably confused the crowds. Church, I know that when you're living your life, you don't hear the voice of Christ. So it can appear that He is silent in your life. 
When we engage in sin, it can appear that Christ doesn't care because you don't hear Christ coming and reprimanding you. Perhaps Christ is silent as you gratify the desires of your flesh, so you think He must not really care that much. That's what Caiaphas thought. He must not really care that much since we're hurling insults at Him and He's not defending His name. Perhaps He doesn't even care. Church, I would beg for you to realize that Christ is very much involved in the life of His people. So I ask you this morning, what's your vision of Christ? How do you see Christ? Do you see Christ as this silent, uncaring, distant Savior? Do you see Christ as this nothing of a person to behold? Do you see Christ as someone who is being beaten up by sinful men and in a sense you could care less? Remember what these men did. They declared what Jesus deserved and what, they were, what he was worthy of. Perhaps some of these men thought, actually, I've seen Christ. I saw him save a couple people. I saw him lift Lazarus out of the tomb. I saw him feed 5,000. Perhaps some of the men that are sitting here pronouncing judgments upon Christ saw the miracles that he himself secured. And yet, because of the mob mentality, they feel the pressure to give in. The same can happen to us. Perhaps we ourselves can testify to the goodness of the Lord in our lives. We can testify to what He's done for us, carrying us to and fro, to and fro. And yet, because of the pressure of our family, the pressure of our work environment, the pressure of our friends, we give in to sin. And we say, Christ, you are not worthy of my life. So ask yourself, by your life, by your words, by the testimony that you give others, by your actions, what are you showing that you believe Christ to be worthy of? If someone looked at your life, would they be able to say, no, I know that person by the way that they live, by the things that they say, Christ is worthy to them. Christ is worthy of their obedience. Christ is worthy of them possibly being shamed by their family. Christ is worthy because even when all things are coming down against them, that person has peace, that person has joy. By your actions, what are you communicating about what you think Christ is worthy of? Bottom line, can your life display that you believe Christ to be worthy of your obedience, of your surrender to Him? of your living your life in a wicked and per perverse generation for Him. Because let me tell you, dear church, what Christ is worthy of. He is worthy of honor and power and authority and all praise and our worship. Do you realize that? Christ is worthy of it all. And we think that we can withhold that from Him. These men on this day truly thought that they were the ones to declare what Christ was worthy of on that day. I ask you this morning, what does your life declare about what you believe Christ to be worthy of? I pray that it's the gospel that fuels you to live a life to His honor and to His glory. Especially in our day, dear church. Especially in our day. Why would any Christian begin to give more worth and give more to literally Caesar when Christ is the one who deserves it, when Christ is the one who's worthy. You know, there's that saying that, or that, that verse that says, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render unto God the things that are God's. I'm wondering, all Caesar deserves is tax. That's what that's talking about. I'm wondering why Christians are rendering to Caesar their children, their family, their affections. Why are Christians giving over to Caesar everything that's the Lord's? Because they see Caesar as more worthy. I'm wondering why Christians are constantly giving over, maybe not to Caesar, maybe to sin, their best time, their best efforts, the waking hours that they have. It's all for sin and self. When Christ is worthy, is our life, our Bible reading, our prayer, whatever it is, is it communicating? I think, my, I think Christ is worthy of my time. I have an extra 20 minutes. Am I going to gratify my, my flesh? Am I going to give that extra 20 minutes to the Lord? I can go on and on about this. We all have our own struggles. And the joy is that Christ attained for us the securement of our enjoyment in eternal paradise. 
Salvation is settled. But dear friends and church, I ask you, it's a long way to heaven. Make your life count by showing He's worthy of it. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we're so thankful that Christ truly underwent the most ungodly courtroom of all days in order for Him to go to that cross and secure our salvation. But Lord, the question remains, what do we think Christ is worthy of? What do we think Christ deserves? I pray that it's our life. Every single second of it, I pray that it's our life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.